In the year 2023, I started platinum trophy hunting. There was something about unlocking every trophy a game has to offer and experiencing a game in its entirety that just captivated me. That or I was so tired of playing Call of Duty, literally anything else sounded more appealing. I, I don't know. But a question I get asked a lot is Rob. What were your hardest platinum trophies? What were your favorite platinum trophies? What were your least favorite platinum trophies? Well, ask no more, dear friends, because today we are going to rank all 16 platinum trophies I earned over the last 10 months from easiest to hardest. But to do that, we're gonna have to set some ground rules and go over how exactly I'm going to be ranking these platinums. For each game, I'm going to be taking a few things into consideration when ranking their difficulty. Things like the story and how enjoyable it was to complete, the combat and how difficult it is to master, the exploration experience and how easy or hard it is to navigate around the map. And last but not least, the collectibles. Are they simple and enjoyable like Ghost of Shusama, or do they make you want to nosedive off a diving board into a pool of battery acid like Riddler trophies? Pretty standard stuff. After giving each game a proper ranking, we're going to throw them on this tier list right here. The tiers are as follows. Boring, easy, grindy, challenging, very hard, pure misery, and the worst of the worst, Arkham City Catwoman challenges. Guess what's going there? Let's get it. Everybody always asks why I chose Assassin's Creed Valhalla as my very first platinum trophy. And it was literally because I had just got done watching The Last Kingdom on Netflix. That's literally it. I just wanted to do Viking shit. Assassin's Creed Valhalla really is the redheaded stepchild of the Assassin's Creed franchise. Fans love to pretend that it doesn't actually exist, like it was a bad dream or a figment of our imagination. But after spending a hundred plus hours on Valhalla, I am here to tell you it is real. It does exist. But the real question is, how hard was the Platinum? Well, the first step in getting the AC Valhalla Platinum is to complete the story. And unfortunately, Valhalla's story is 100% the worst part of the game, which is probably like the worst problem a story-based game could have. Valhalla takes place in Saxon, England, following the journey of a Viking named Eivor. Throughout the story, Eivor sets out to build allies with surrounding kingdoms while also uncovering the mystery of where he and his brother come from with the help of an assassin friend named Basim. You may have heard of him. The main issue with Valhalla's story is that it's unbearably repetitive. You literally do the same thing over and over and over. Show up at a random kingdom, make friends with the leader of the kingdom, solve a conflict for said leader of said kingdom, boom, they're your ally. Do that 16 more times. Now, would this typically be a massive issue that makes a game unbearable to play? Not necessarily. Some games can get away with having a mediocre story. But when the game's main story is 60 hours long, it's an issue. Valhalla's story isn't the worst I've played, but it's agonizingly long and boring, which made getting the platinum for it that much more tedious. Full disclosure, I actually did not play Valhalla on the hardest difficulty. It was my very first platinum, and I was not the psychotic maniac that I am now playing everything on the hardest difficulties. So it's kind of hard to gauge how difficult the game's combat can be be without actually playing the hardest difficulty myself. So for the sake of the video, I'll just rank this based on my personal experience playing on normal and say that the game can be difficult if you're in an area you're not supposed to be. But if you do side stuff as you go and level up accordingly, it's a fairly chill experience. It's no Dark Souls or anything. As far as the exploration experience goes, Valhalla is really no different than any other Assassin's Creed. It allows you to fast travel between viewpoints or travel on horseback. But Saxon England is unbelievably big. First time I've ever heard that in my life. It's mostly just open, barren land with cities sprinkled in that don't have a lot going on. But Rob, that's what England was like back then. I know. It's boring. But nothing is more boring than Assassin's Creed Valhalla collectibles. Almost 800 collectibles total, the Valhalla collectible grind is what makes this platinum so rough. You're not gonna fight Melania or Sigrun the Valkyrie Queen or do ridiculous combat challenges. You just have to have the sheer willpower to push through the most boring collectible experience known to man. Chest, flying pieces of paper, all sorts of dirty barnacles to do in this game. I mean, just look at this monstrosity of a map. The bloat is 
unreal. Overall, I don't think Valhalla is as bad of a game as everybody says it is, and it's definitely not difficult to platinum, but it is going to take you well over 100 hours to get it. So, I mean, I think it's only fair that we put it in grindy. That platinum really did suck balls, bro. <laughs> and hey, speaking of balls, have you ever heard of a Manscaped? Worst ad transition I have ever done. It's not even close. This video is sponsored by Manscaped.com the global men's lifestyle brand that is revolutionizing the landscape of men's grooming. Which is great because I need the money to fund my Lego addiction. Manscaped is the go-to for grooming tools for over 10 million bros across the globe. And if my math is right, that is over 20 million balls. That's a lot of balls. And today I wanna to talk to you about Manscaped's latest endeavor in the men's grooming world, the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra. Featuring the brand new Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra trimmer. The Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra has next gen dual skin safe blade heads featuring an upgraded trimmer blade and an interchangeable foil blade for enhanced performance. With the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra, what you want to do is start your grooming sessions with the trimmer blade, which now has longer, wider, and rounded teeth that cut through hair a lot easier while also being incredibly gentle on the skin. From there, you swap out the trimmer blade for the foil blade. It just pops right off like this. Simple as that. The purpose of the foil blade is to get you down to skin length level to get you that baby smooth finish all the ladies love. The Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra is literally like two trimmers in one. On top of the dual blade heads, the Lawnmower 5.0 also features a bigger LED light to make it easier to see those hard to reach areas, USB-C charging, a travel lock for convenient portability, and it's waterproof. What more could you ask for? With the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra, you also get the Weed Whacker 2.0. This bad boy is built with skin safe technology, making trimming those pesky ear and nose hairs easier than ever before. And we also can't forget our Crop Soother and Crop Preserver. The Crop Soother is for those delicate areas. Gives you a lot of relief after you shave your manhood. Trust me, you, you want this. I've had some not so great experiences in the past shaving my balls. And the Crop Preserver is literally ball deodorant, and it is amazing. You want things to be fresh down there, boys. I know your gaming chairs be smelling crazy. I know they do. And with all that being said, when you purchase the Performance 5.0 package, you also get two free gifts. First, you got the Manscaped Boxers 2.0. Hey, yo! They're so soft, bro. I be feeling so sexy when I wear these, I can't lie. And then you got the Shed 2.0. This is like your grooming command station. It keeps all your grooming tools nice and organized. I love it. Do not miss out, guys join the 10 million men and 20 million balls on the planet that put their trust in Manscaped for all things grooming and hygiene. Head over to manscaped.com right now and get your hands on the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra today. And the best part is when you use my promo code IAMROB at checkout, you will get 20% off, free international shipping, plus two free gifts. Yo, Hell of a deal if you ask me. Once again, I want to thank Manscaped for sponsoring today's video and funding my Lego addiction. I feel like everybody forgot Hogwarts Legacy came out last year, which is insane because this was the best-selling game of 2023. Hogwarts Legacy's Platinum was far from difficult, but I'd be lying if I said it was a walk in Hogsmeade. You start the Platinum off by completing the main story, like with any Platinum, and I'm not gonna lie, it was a tad underwhelming. The story in this game was incredibly cliche, it was predictable, and to be honest with you, it really just wasn't that interesting. The main villain was pretty hilarious, though. Rip Hasbulla. But my defense for Hogwarts Legacy has always been that it's not about the story. It's about the exploration. It is so obvious the team that developed this game was full of nothing but Harry Potter nerds that spend every holiday in Universal Studios drinking butterbeer. Every square inch of Hogwarts Castle, Hogsmeade, and the surrounding area makes you feel like you are in the world of Harry Potter. I will never get tired of flying around on that damn broom. But all of that aside, how difficult was the Platinum? Well, for one, the game itself is very easy. Even on hard difficulty, the combat is incredibly simple and it's pretty hard to die. The only thing that makes Hogwarts Legacy's Platinum difficult is a tedious collectible grind. The collectibles in this game can be a lot of fun at first and you can tell a lot of love went into each one, but it can get extremely repetitive, especially when you start approaching the end. On top of the collectibles, you also have to breed all the different types of beasts and do a bunch of stuff with the room of requirements 
requirement. And then to actually get the platinum, you have to play the first two hours of the main story four separate times. And that was a total snooze fest. For all, I do have fond memories of my time platinuming Hogwarts Legacy, but it was a total snooze sandwich towards the end, which unfortunately is going to put it right next to Assassin's Creed Valhalla in Grindy. Jedi Fallen Order is one of my all-time favorite Star Wars games, and for good reason. It follows the story of Cal Kestis, a rogue Jedi that survived Order 66. I mean, come on, bro, that's never been done before. I want to preface this by saying, I love Fallen Order as a game. I remember beating it on Xbox One when it first came out, and I was in love with it. But the Platinum? Not that fun. And it's not because of the combat, even though that could be excruciatingly difficult if you decide to play it on Grandmaster. I personally did not, because I am a coward and it's not necessarily because of a repetitive collectible grind like Valhalla or Hogwarts. It's because Jedi Fallen Order has one of the worst exploration experiences I have ever had in a video game. Fallen Order is a semi-linear game, meaning it's not open world, but there are several different planets to explore with many different paths to take. And the maps of each planet have got to be the most confusing shit I have ever laid my eyes on. To get the platinum, you have to 100% explore every single planet, meaning that you literally have to set Cal Kestis's two size 11 feet on every square inch of Dathomir, Zepho, every planet. This is incredibly hard to do when you don't even know where you are on the map 99% of the time. Couple that with the fact that there's no fast travel and anytime you want to leave and go to a different planet, you have to run all the way back to your ship and try not to get lost. Oh, and did I mention that Dathomir exists? Oh my God. Go! This is, dude, this is insane. I really hate Dathomir. Overall, Fallen Order isn't necessarily a difficult platinum, especially when you're playing on lower or normal difficulties. But the exploration experience makes it so difficult to navigate the map when you're trying to clean up all the miscellaneous and collectible trophies. So, I mean, I gotta put it in grindy again, man. I mean, I don't really want to put it in challenging, but it's not easy. I promise I'm not gonna put everything in grindy. Jedi Survivor is another game I feel like people forgot came out in 2023, which is really unfortunate because it was one of my favorite stories of the year. It's basically Jedi Fallen Order 2.0, but better in every way possible. Except now I wouldn't leave Cal alone in the same room with my wife. Narratively speaking, Jedi Survivor was a joy to play. Incredible story, incredible side activities, top-notch saber customization, great game. Besides the fact that it tried to set my PS5 on fire when it first came out, but combat-wise, it's pretty much an exact replica of Fallen Order with some improvements. And just like Fallen Order, this game is incredibly difficult if you play on Grandmaster. And just like Fallen Order, I did not play on Grandmaster because I am a coward. I can say, however, with full confidence that Jedi Survivor has a much better platinum experience than Fallen Order. You didn't necessarily have to 100% explore every planet or even get all the collectibles to get the platinum. And there was also fast travel added, making the cleanup after the main story much easier. Was it perfect? No, I still found myself getting lost quite a bit, and I think the issue really lies in the map design itself, and I really hope they fix that in the third game. Also, there was an Ogdo Bogdo gank fight, and that automatically hurts its score for me. Complete psychopath over there at Respawn Entertainment. Oh, I don't want to do it. This is like my worst nightmare, dog. Go away, Ogdo. Dude, this is gonna be awful. What maniac at Respawn Entertainment thought that was a, a fun idea? But overall, Jedi Survivor was a pretty fun Platinum experience, and I'm gonna go ahead and throw it in easy. Ah, uh, Ghost of Shusima. Shusima, Shusima. I, you know, I don't know. Everybody got really mad at that video because I pronounced everything wrong. I am sorry for being so white, I guess. <laughs> Ghost of Shusima was the first game I platinum that I decided to do on the hardest difficulty. In this game's case, Lethal Difficulty. Lethal Difficulty is incredibly rewarding, but also incredibly unforgiving. You kill enemies quickly with properly timed parries, and it is so satisfying. But you also die in one to two hits, depending on the enemy. But in my opinion, playing on Lethal Difficulty is the only way to play this game. I could not imagine playing it on a lower difficulty. 
difficulty. Not only was Ghost of Tsushima one of my favorite stories of the year out of all the games I platinumed, but it was by far my favorite collectible experience. Haikus, hot springs, duels, on top of the fact that you could literally fast travel anywhere on the map whenever you wanted, making the cleanup after the main story a complete cakewalk. The only thing that made this platinum difficult was the fact that I was playing on lethal difficulty. Dude, that first Ryuzo fight still lives in my head rent free. Come on. But even though a lot of the in-game bosses were extremely difficult, I don't think this necessarily belongs in very hard or pure misery. But it was definitely harder than Valhalla, Hogwarts, and Fallen Order, so we're gonna put it in challenging. I remember being a lifelong Xbox fanboy, and when Spider-Man PS4 came out, I literally drove to GameStop and bought a PS4 specifically so I could play this game. And it was worth every penny. So when I decided to get the Platinum for the remastered version this year, I was pleasantly surprised to find how well the game held up. A beautiful story, fun combat mechanics, a magnificent exploration experience, and a solid collectible grind, Spider-Man is a must-have Platinum for all trophy hunters. With this Platinum, I continued my trend of playing everything on the hardest difficulty and played this game on Spectacular and Ultimate, a difficulty unlocked in New Game Plus after beating the game on Spectacular. And I can honestly say, I don't remember dying more than a handful of times throughout my entire playthrough, including New Game Plus. This game's combat is extremely satisfying, but it is also incredibly easy. Ultimate still really wasn't enough to present any type of real difficulty, and oddly enough, I think that kind of holds it back a little bit as a game. It is a very easy Platinum, even with all the DLC, I think you can do it in like 50 hours. I would almost want to put it in boring if it wasn't for the main story being so good and swinging around around New York being so fun. So we'll just throw it right next to Jedi Survivor in easy. This is truly where the Rob Cinematic Universe was born. As many of you know, God of War truly is one of the easiest platinum trophies out there to add to your collection. With only a 3 to 4 out of 10 difficulty rating, you can have God of War's platinum in 30 to 40 hours. But if you're like me, this was not the case. No, I, being the psychopath that I am, decided to complete God of War's Platinum on the game's hardest difficulty. Give me God of War. Let me preface all of this by saying, God of War's story, 10 out of 10. God of War's exploration, 10 out of 10. God of War's collectibles, 10 out of 10. But oh my God. The combat in this game on Give Me God of War is so unbelievably unforgiving, it is insane. Up to this point in my Platinum Trophy endeavors, this was in fact my biggest challenge yet. I had never really played a game this difficult, so a lot of my struggles could have stemmed from simple inexperience. But man, some of the situations God of War 2018 throws you into are just complete cheese. Most of the main story is fairly bearable, unless we're talking about Alfheim. The real struggle with the Give Me God of War Platinum is the end game when you have to do the Muspelheim trials and fight all the Valkyries. Complete nightmare fuel, brother. My fight against Sigrun the Valkyrie Queen was a canon event in the Rob Cinematic Universe. It was my Iron Man 1. It literally took me four and a half hours hours to beat her. To this day, the hardest boss I have ever had the displeasure of fighting in a video game. Even with the best armor and fully leveled weapons, you basically had to play the fight perfectly with zero mistakes. All it took was one missed parry or dodge and it was GG's. Might as well restart from checkpoint. It was a miserable fight, but the feeling I had when I finally beat her was unmatched. <laughs> So God of War 2018's Platinum on the hardest difficulty was completely brutal. I want to put it in very hard, but there's other games I'm going to have there that weren't as bad as God of War 2018. So it looks like we have us a pure misery on our hands, folks. I think we can all guess where this one's going to go. The Miles Morales Platinum is probably one of the most chill Platinum trophies on PlayStation. And much like Spider-Man PS4, it would probably be classified as boring if it wasn't for the story and exploration being so fun. It is not a long game at all. I'm pretty sure you can beat the main story in like six hours or so. I did play it on the hardest difficulty, and just like Spider-Man Remastered, it was still a breeze. Besides that 100-hit combo trophy, it, it did get me a few times. What is 
that. Isaiah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm not going to rage. Everybody just shut up. Miles Morales is essentially Spider-Man PS4 DLC. And I am completely fine with that. It was great. The collectibles were easy. The game as a whole was easy. The miscellaneous trophies were easy, but they were also a lot of quality fun. Really the only complaint I would have here is that you do have to beat the game on New Game Plus to get the platinum. And I hate it when games do that because it just, it's really repetitive. But like I said, it is very short. So it's really no big deal. So yeah, no surprise here. Miles Morales is going in easy. MW2 is my favorite Call of Duty of all time and one of my favorite games of all time. The real MW2, not whatever this is. And considering I got my start in content creation playing COD, I was incredibly excited to revisit this one and get the platinum. But unfortunately, this did end up being my most underwhelming platinum of the year. You earn most of the trophies for this game by playing through the campaign on veteran difficulty. And if you've ever played a Call of Duty campaign on veteran, you know this can present some adversity. And there were some parts of the campaign that gave me a lot of trouble, specifically that stupid favela mission. I'm pretty sure like 40% percent of my deaths in the run happened on that mission alone <laughs> but once you get past that part the rest of the campaign really isn't all that bad i mean it's just typical call of duty veteran difficulty just pre-aim everything and play really slow and you're good after you beat the campaign on veteran you basically have to run through the entire game again without dying which you do on recruit then grab all the intel on every level i don't know man this one was just unfortunately a snooze fest for me i will say beating the pit in 18 seconds did put a few gray hairs in my head though that sucked ass in conclusion even though there were parts of mw2 that were very hard and gave me a lot of trouble most of the platinum was just incredibly boring to me man by far the least enjoyable one i've done so it's going in boring Truly one of the greatest video game stories ever written, The Last of Us Part 1 is an experience that all gamers need to have at least once. And much like God of War, the platinum for The Last of Us Part 1 remake is extremely easy if you play on a normal difficulty. But you guys know by now, we don't do that here. This platinum is very straightforward, nothing fancy. Beat the game, get the collectibles, do the DLC, boom, platinum. But doing it on the hardest difficulty, grounded, makes things a little more complicated than that. I've said it once and I'll say it again. Grounded difficulty on The Last of Us is not actually difficult. I mean, sure, you die in a couple of hits and the enemies have better situational awareness than Jack Reacher after his morning creatine shake. But the combat and gunplay isn't that hard to get the hang of. What really makes grounded difficulty such a tough experience is the fact that it's actually a resource conservation simulator. I swear I went into every enemy encounter in this game with two bullets, a tampon, and a roll of duct tape. All right, I have zero bullets. That's cool. Dude, they drop one bullet. What is this? Are we serious right now? Most of the clicker encounters really weren't all that bad. You just have to play it very slow and use a lot of bricks and bottles as distractions. The human encounters on grounded difficulty are what really get you. Dude, there were some encounters in this game that took me multiple hours to complete. That part where Ellie is up top with the sniper and Joel has to take out like literally 30 dudes on the ground still gives me nightmares. Come on, everybody. Come on. That's crazy. And don't even get me started on that David fight, brother. Bro was smoking that EDP 45 pack. Hello, Ellie. Yeah, I do. No, Jesus Christ, no. I do remember the collectible experience being extremely easy and getting through it in a couple of hours. But on the remake, you have to do the left behind DLC to get the platinum. And that was a doozy. Playing as Ellie in a shopping mall with nothing but a brick and three arrows was enough to send me over the edge. For all, The Last of Us Part 1's Platinum can be pretty horrific on grounded difficulty, but I don't think it was as bad as Give Me God of War. So we'll put it in very hard. The things I would do to wipe my memory clean men in black myself, so to speak, so I can experience the platinum for this game for the first time again. God of War Ragnarok, in my opinion, was an improvement to its predecessor in every way, shape, and form. Better story, better combat, better exploration, better everything. And just like its predecessor, it is a very easy platinum to obtain. But again, that's not the case when you do it on Give Me God of War. Ragnarok's story is a complete and total masterpiece, and that's honestly understating it. But along 
along the way, you encounter some pretty difficult enemies and bosses that will make you want to rip your hair out if you're playing on the hardest difficulty. Those freaking werewolf creatures were the bane of my existence. However, the real challenge of the God of War Ragnarok Platinum isn't tough enemies or combat. It's getting through the Ironwood section without falling asleep. Challenge level impossible. Now, I will say, I don't know if it's because I was just more experienced this time around, but Ragnarok's Platinum was much easier for me to get than God of War 2018. The enemy encounters weren't near as cheesy, the boss fights and parry timing weren't near as unforgiving, and the Berserkers were not even close to as hard as the Valkyries. Except that three-way gank fight. Santa Monica was vile for that one. I do get asked a lot which one I think's harder, Gana on Give Me God of War or Sigrun on Give Me God of War, and I can say with full confidence, in my humble opinion of course, that Sigrun is 10 times worse than Gana. Like I said previously, Sigrun took me over 4 hours hours to complete, whereas Gana only took me like an hour to an hour and a half or something like that. Gana was simply way more forgiving and I felt like I could get away with more mistakes. That's how it felt for me anyway, I don't know, maybe I was just better at the game at that point. Other than the difficulty itself, Ragnarok's Platinum is very simple. It's just your typical collectible and exploration grind plus beating the game. It's not as bad as God of War 2018, but it is harder than Ghost of Shusima. So that's going to give us another very hard. For the first time since 2015, Ubisoft decided to deliver an Assassin's Creed game that was, well, actually an Assassin's Creed game. Following the journey of Basim, you may have heard of him, you explore 9th century Baghdad and seek to dismantle the Order of the Ancients from within while uncovering the secrets of Basim's past. To the last one. Oops. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I think he's okay. Mirage's Platinum is fairly easy to complete, and this was another one that I did decide to do on the hardest difficulty. But that didn't even matter because the enemies in this game are dumber than Dan Campbell on 4th and 8. <laughs> but we'll get to that in a minute. Like all Assassin's Creed Platinums, Mirage is a very simple process. Beat the game, do the collectibles, do the miscellaneous trophies. And Ubisoft did something with Mirage that had never been done in an Assassin's Creed game before. It had a map that wasn't a disgusting, bloated mess. I know, I was just as surprised as you. The main issue with most AC games is that there's just too much going on. There's activities and collectibles on the map for no reason at all other than to just be there and give the player something to do, even if that something is without purpose or thought. And surprisingly, Mirage wasn't like that at all. There wasn't any blow, and I never felt like I was doing side activities for the sole purpose of just marking a checklist to get them done, which is a step in the right direction for the franchise. However, even though I'm happy that the game went back to the roots of Assassin's Creed and the map wasn't a bloated mess, this Platinum was still fairly underwhelming for me. The combat, even on the hardest difficulty, was not hard enough, unless you fight one of those Shakira dudes, they were the worst. And even though the game was built around stealth, it didn't matter because the AI was so dumb it basically ruined the entire experience, even on the hardest difficulty. The story itself was boring until the final act, but even the final act doesn't save the fact that Basim is overall a boring character who we already know the outcome of. But the collectible and exploration experience was pretty good, so no complaints there. In conclusion, AC Mirage's Platinum is not hard at all, and the game itself is not interesting enough to label as easy or in enjoyable. So that means we got us another boring, which actually really pains me to say because I do not think this was a bad game. Way better than Valhalla. This was my game of the year and you cannot take that away from me. Spider-Man 2 is much like God of War Ragnarok for me meaning it was an improvement to its predecessor in every single way. The story was better. I know a lot of people are going to disagree with that, but it's just my opinion. Combat was better. Exploration and swinging was better. The collectibles were better. Everything was just better. But in comparison to Spider-Man 1, how hard was the Platinum? Well, I would say it's pretty much identical on a difficulty level. But I will say that spectacular difficulty on Spider-Man 2 might have been just a little bit harder than Spider-Man 1. I did find myself dying from time to time, which was actually a nice change of pace. I don't necessarily love playing a game and never facing any type of challenge. I think it kind of ruins the experience as a whole and it 
even breaks my immersion a little bit. There were actual boss fights in this game with health bars. They weren't just glorified cutscenes with button prompts like the first one. Dude, the lizard boss fight actually got me a few times. I ain't even gonna lie. Oh my God. My only complaint with Spider-Man 2's Platinum is that it just wasn't long enough, man. Playing on spectacular difficulty, I think I completed it in around 22 hours, which is just insane. I'm pretty sure the first game is around a 40 hour Platinum without the DLC. So this did disappoint me a bit because I loved the game that much and I wanted it to keep going. It was definitely not a boring Platinum. It was a lot of fun, but there was really not much about it that was hard at all. So we're gonna throw it in easy. The first part of the trilogy that broke me. Arkham Asylum's Platinum is definitely the easiest of the three Arkham games. You beat the game on hard, you do the Riddler challenges, then you do the Combat and Predator challenges. Fairly simple, and I actually got this Platinum in like 17 hours. But it is not entirely a walk in the park. Beating the game on hard, nothing to it. Riddler challenges? Very easy in this game. But the Combat and Predator challenges? miserable. The Arkham games have combat challenges and they have predator challenges. To get the platinum, you have to get all three medals on every single challenge in the game. The combat challenges are challenges where you fight enemies in waves and have to get a certain amount of score to get all the medals. And the predator challenges are stealth based challenges where you have to complete specific tasks within the map to get the medals. They both suck ass. The amount of times I would get two or three medals and then die in the most brain dead way possible is mind numbing. Arkham Asylum's platinum isn't even close to as bad as Arkham City or Arkham Knight, but it was still an experience that I do not plan on ever going through again in my lifetime. Arkham Asylum was very hard at times with the combat and predator stuff, but because it was so short, I'm not going to put it in the same category as Ragnarok and The Last of Us Part 1, so that's going to put it in challenging. I hate this video again. Arkham City's Platinum from beginning to end is the stuff of nightmares. The very second you finish the main story and the side missions, every ounce of fun you experienced up to that point is gone. And from that point on, it's nothing but a barren wasteland where dreams go to die. Did I mention that this Platinum is miserable? Before you even get to the shit show that is the combat and predator challenges, you have to endure 440 Riddler trophies. Why did Rocksteady choose violence like this? In all seriousness, Arkham City's Platinum isn't all that bad if you just do the base game. Beat the game, do the side stuff and Riddler trophies, do Batman's combat and Predator stuff, 100% new game plus, and boom, Platinum is yours. But me, being the entertainer that I am, thought that it would be a fun idea to do all the DLC as well. You know, for the content. And little did I know that this was going to be the worst decision that I have ever made for one reason and one reason only, Catwoman. I really can't even put into words how miserable of an experience this was. Catwoman DLC trophies were miserable, Robin sucked, Nightwing was awful too. This is my favorite game of all time, but because of the platinum, I hate it now. If God of War 2018 was my Iron Man 1, Arkham City was my Infinity War. So yeah, it's going all the way up top. Shocker there. Dude, I can't do anything but laugh thinking about this shit. I genuinely don't know how it could get any worse than Arkham City, but it did. Arkham Knight's Platinum was very similar to Arkham City. You first have to beat the game, then do the side stuff, then do the Riddler challenges, which weren't near as bad as City, by the way. There was literally like half as much in Arkham Knight. But where things get different is the challenges. Unlike Arkham City, you don't have to get every single medal on every single map to get the Platinum. There are so many different challenges in the game and a lot of the DLC counted towards your overall medals, so you can really pick and choose what you want to do and what you don't want to do and still get the trophies you need. So as far as getting the Platinum itself, I would say that Arkham Knight is just grindy more than anything. It's really not all that difficult. It's definitely not as bad as City, or at least that's what I thought until I got to the Community Challenge Pack. When I say that these were by far the worst trophies I've ever gone for, I mean that. The two that gave me the most trouble were for completing multiple maps without breaking your combo and without taking any damage as four separate characters. So you basically have to complete two separate maps perfectly with no mistake seven or eight times. As I stated in my Arkham Trilogy video, the community challenge pack broke things in me that will never be fixed. <laughs> Oh, 
why am I laughing? Overall, I don't think Arkham Knight is as hard of a platinum as Arkham City, but it does have specific trophies that are harder than anything in Arkham City, if that makes sense. I don't know. It made sense in my head. I do think that balances things out and puts Arkham Knight right next to Arkham City all the way at the top. These both had a severe impact on my mental health. I, I can't lie. And that does it, folks. This is my platinum trophy tier list of 2023. We will revisit this next year. We got some heaters lined up. I'm incredibly excited for what's in store for the Rob Cinematic Universe. We are going to go crazy this year. Be sure to drop a like on the video if you enjoyed it. It helps me out a ton. And subscribe if you're brand new while we are on the road to 200,000 subscribers. That does not even sound real. And if you haven't already, be sure to watch this video. It is amazing.